It is good to be with you again tonight. If you have any updates to our prayer concerns, I hope you'll let me know by sending me an email, fourlakeschurch at gmail.com, or by giving me a phone call, 608-224-0274. Feel free to call or text that number. I'd love to hear from you. I usually work on the bulletin on Saturday, so I'd love to get those updates before then so we can make sure everything is accurate. Uh, please remember that we are continuing to have the two worship services every Sunday, one at 9 and then the second service at 10.30 a.m. And again, we're doing this to keep our building capacity uh, in mind, so we're keeping that down to 25% of the number allowed in our building to give us plenty of space to spread out and to be safe. And so please be sure to sign up for one of those two services using the Sign Up Genius account, and that link is sent out regularly in the bulletin and by email. And if you have any problems with that, please feel free to get in touch with either me or Kenna, and we'd be glad to get, in, uh, get back with you on that and make sure that you're signed up. I know we haven't had a chance to share any good news lately. This is one of the things that I miss the most about not being able to be together is just the Christian fellowship and being able to check in with each other and hear the things that we're thankful for in this life. Feel free to do that on the comments, but I know that very few of you have access to the comments. If you're not signed in, that's not available. If you're not signed into YouTube, and then also some of you have this projected on the big screen or whatever in your house and have it gone, uh, having gone full screen, the comments a lot of times aren't visible. So we just don't have access to be able to uh, share these things with each other in a live kind of way. But in my life, uh, my good news for the week is that I used some of my uh, newly found knot tying skills from Aaron Grodi's knot class at Beaver Creek Bible Camp a few years ago. And I was able to use those new skills to hang my new kayak from the ceiling out here in my garage. And we now have six pulleys, uh, a series of hooks and straps, and 100 feet of rope. Uh, holding that kayak to the ceiling. And so if you hear a loud crashing noise, <laughs> that's probably what that is. But it's been up there uh, for about 24 hours now. So far, so good. And the good part of that is I was able to get that up there on my own. And so I've put it up and down a few times. And so uh, it was hard to find a place to store that. If you've ever been in my garage, you know there's a lot of stuff in here and it is very efficiently stored. Let's put it that way. So just a, a few square feet left to store that kayak but right now it is strapped to the ceiling and I'm thankful to have a way of getting that up there and stored safely so I can get it down easily and go out there and get on some of our uh, local waterways. So that's what I'm thankful for. The knot skills came came in handy this week and I'm thankful for that. Uh, tonight we are ready to get back to our study of Luke. We're maybe a third of the way through Luke. In our class I'll be referring again to a book that I have uh, mentioned over and over and over again through the years, a few daughters, uh, a few not a few daughters ago, a few weeks ago, my daughter said it sounds like an infomercial for this book, and I, I guess it is. So I'm not making anything on this, but this is a good resource, and it has been so helpful to me in sermon preparation and personal study and class preparation to have the four gospel accounts lined up side by side. So it's a valuable tool. There really isn't a good quality online version of this so there's no app or website no software that i know of that does as good of a job as just a, an old-fashioned paper book made out of a dead tree to get that job done if you don't have it yet if you need help if you can't afford it let me know it's that important about 25 bucks on amazon should be here in a few days if you're interested uh, by way of review in this class, we know that Luke was a Gentile. He was a medical doctor. He made a point of writing in chronological order. He points this out in the opening of the book of Luke. And he also writes the book of Acts. So basically we have volume 1, volume 2. Volume 1 is Luke, the life of Christ, covering a period of about 30 years. Volume 2 is the book of Acts, covering the birth and the growth of the early church from roughly 30 to 60 A.D. And uh, Luke did a good job of including some groups that were often overlooked or discriminated against in the ancient world. Women and widows and lepers and the sick and Samaritans and, and on and on like that. And we're going to see that in our class tonight. Uh, last week we looked at the second half of Luke 9 and the first half of Luke 10. We had James and John offer to call down fire from heaven because a Samaritan village 
uh, turn them away, if you remember that. And then we had Jesus also send out 70 disciples on something of a limited commission. And then we had the reports come back concerning that trip, that journey that these 70 people went on. And so that is what we covered last Wednesday evening. So tonight we pick up with Luke 10, verse 25, and we hope to make it through Luke 11, verse 13. So we're covering the rest of chapter 10, and we'll get a couple paragraphs into chapter 11 if the Lord wills tonight. So let's start tonight with Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 29. Luke 10, verses 25 through 29. And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In the recent past, in our study of Luke, Jesus has had some run-ins with the religious leaders, and this time it's a lawyer who speaks up. The lawyers in the ancient world were those who were experts in the law of Moses. And this man, this lawyer, comes to Jesus for some clarification, maybe for an argument, depending on how we look at this. But he's probably there, if we look at it in a positive way, just to have a discussion. So he's a well-educated person. He has some skill in the law. He probably has some opinions in the law. And as often happens when well-educated people get together, they tend to discuss what they are good at discussing. And so his expertise is the law. And he finds Jesus, who is obviously an expert in the law himself. And so this lawyer's question is, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And so I would just point out he addresses Jesus as teacher. So that's a term of respect. And he wants to know what he needs to do in order to live forever. How do I get eternal life? And what we might find interesting is that Jesus does not give a direct answer. It would have been very easy for Jesus just to say, do this. Of course, Jesus, as he often does, does not answer directly, but he answers the question with a question. And this is what we love about Jesus in his teaching style. He was an expert at asking questions and one benefit of asking questions is that it encourages people to think for themselves. And so he's not just giving answers, but he's encouraging rational thought based on the word of God. He wants people to think for themselves. He's encouraging this man to take what he knows about God's law and to apply it. And so he's trying to get this man to apply the word of God in his own life. And the Lord's question pretty much throws it right back. What is written in the law? How does it read to you? In other words, you're an expert. You tell me what you need to do. And in his vast knowledge of God's law, notice how the lawyer boils it all down. So he's got the entire law of Moses, the whole Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, as we sometimes refer to it, and he boils it down. Number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then number two, love your neighbor as yourself. That's a pretty good summary, isn't it? That is the whole law summarized in just a few brief comments. And Jesus affirms, this is the correct answer. You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live, which is interesting. That's enough to keep us busy for a lifetime, isn't it? Now, though, the lawyer wants to justify himself. And so they've already agreed about what the law actually says. The man has given an answer. Jesus has affirmed it is a good answer. And now the lawyer wants to discuss how the law is to be applied. And obviously this is where it often breaks down, doesn't it? We know what the Bible says, but what does it actually mean for us? What does this mean for me? This is the so what section, as we sometimes describe it in our, in our lessons every Sunday. If you remember, John the Baptist did a very good job of giving some very specific answers to this question. Remember what he told the tax collectors? They wanted to know what they had to actually do, what repentance looked like for them. And he told them, collect no more than you're commanded to, and, and so on. He told the soldiers, 
who ask the same question. Don't take money by force. Be content with your wages and so on. And there were several groups there that John addressed. But Jesus, instead of giving specifics, as John the Baptist did earlier, he's about to turn this around. And once again, he's going to toss it back to the lawyer and he's going to have the lawyer answer the question himself. So let's continue on then with Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 37. Luke 10, 30 through 37. Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers. And they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, The one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do the same. And so obviously we have here what is commonly referred to, commonly known today as the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I think many people in the world today would probably recognize this story. Um, many would probably recognize it as being from the Bible, although less and less so in our society today. But it starts with Jesus describing this man who's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And if we look at a map, we find that Jericho is actually around 18 miles northeast of Jerusalem. But it's down in the sense that it is downhill. I was reading that something somewhere around 3,000 feet of an elevation change in 18 miles. That's a huge difference. And so it is a, a rocky mountain type path. And so this man, as he's making this 18 mile journey, Along the way, he gets robbed, stripped of his clothing, and beaten. And he's even beaten to the point that the robbers leave him half dead. So at this point, as this man is laying there by the side of the road, we have a series of people pass by on this road. And we need to remember, again, this is not a four-lane divided highway, is it? This is a narrow mountain pass kind of path. This is a, a footpath, so, People would travel on this with uh, donkeys or horses by, by foot mainly. And the first man to pass by is a priest and then a Levite. So one after the other. Both of these men pass by on the other side. And in this short story, we're not told why they pass by on the other side. We can probably imagine they might have had some fairly good rational reasons for not stopping, at least in their own mind, the way they justified themselves. There's a chance this might have been a trap of some kind. I mean, after all, if you come across a man who's not dead, but half dead, there's a chance that whoever did this to the man is somewhere nearby. Or it could have been a decoy. It could have been somebody laying there on the road hoping that you stopped to help who would then jump up and attack you. We've seen this even in, in Madison. Uh, these men might have been just in a hurry, might not have had anything to do with the man laying there on the road. Uh, the priest and the Levite might have had business to conduct, things to do, people to see, speeches to give, and so on. Maybe they just didn't want to be bothered. Maybe they'd been through this before, didn't like how it turned out. They had other things that they needed to do. And since one is a priest and one is the Levite, what might the more important thing they're planning on doing actually be? Uh, perhaps worship of some kind. I mean, if a priest and a Levite pass by, these are men whose job is to serve in the temple or to serve religiously in some way. And so perhaps in their minds, whatever they were about to do is more important or more urgent than helping a half-dead man by the side of the road. Some have speculated that they didn't want to be unclean. They would 
get unclean if they touch the dead body according to the law of Moses. And so that guy is not looking too good. Let's not risk it. And let's just keep on going. So a number of ways that they could have perhaps justified in their own minds not stopping to help. A thought question here. Since this is a made-up story, why didn't Jesus say that a carpenter and a fisherman pass by on the other side? Why not some secular occupation? Obviously, we aren't told, of course, but it seems that Jesus is uh, tweaking the religious leaders a little bit. He's kind of poking at these men. And the man who is asking the question definitely seems to be in that category. He is an expert in the law of Moses. And so it seems as Jesus is telling this story, as he's painting this picture, he's including the man who's asking the question and people like him, his friends, his peers, and he's including them in the story. And so the, the, the priest and the Levite are going down the road. They cross by on the other side. So Jesus makes this very practical. There's no way to wiggle out of the application that he's about to make. You know, not only do these two men pass by, but these are men very much like the man who's asking the question. And so the priest and the Levite pass by on the other side, but then a Samaritan shows up. And unlike the other two, we are specifically told that the Samaritan is on a journey. So he's not just passing by, he is on his way somewhere on some kind of a lengthy journey. The priest and the Levite are just going down the road. The Samaritan is on a journey. It may or may not be significant, but to me, the way I look at this, it's more difficult to stop and help somebody when you're on a journey as opposed to just going down the road. And so if I'm over here by my house and I'm heading out to Aldi and somewhere in the three uh, you know, seven-tenths of a mile between here and there, if I come across somebody in need of help, it's easier for me to help them than it is if I'm on my way from here to Tennessee. It's more convenient. It's more doable close to home. But here is a Samaritan who's on a journey. We assume he's far from home because he's traveling in this way. And yet he is the one who stops. And so as I see it, the Samaritan is not from the area, but he's passing through. And so for him, helping is probably a little bit more difficult than it would be for the priest and the Levite. But this is what he does. He sees what has happened. So, number one, he sees. He observes with his eyes. Then, not only does he see, but he has compassion. And so his heart is moved. He sees somebody in trouble. Then his heart tells him to do something about it. And then he actually does what needs to be done. And at this point, I'm wondering, did the priest and the Levite not feel compassion? That is, are they hard-hearted, uncaring people? Or do they feel compassion, but ignore their compassion? And I'm not really sure which one it is, and I'm not sure which one is worse. Uh, but both are pretty bad, because they definitely see the man, don't they? That's not the issue. It's not that they're walking down the road and just didn't see the guy over in a corner somewhere. No, they see him, and they pass by on the other side. So they ignore the man. Either they feel compassion and they ignore their compassion, or they're just cold-hearted people who don't even feel anything when they see a man in this situation. The Samaritan, though, sees, he feels compassion, and then he does what needs to be done. He bandages up the man's wounds. He pours oil and wine on those wounds. He puts this man on his own beast. If he's riding his own beast, he gets off, puts the man on, and then he brings him to an inn and takes care of him himself. Basically, the Samaritan is living by what we would know today as the golden rule. He is treating this man just as he himself would like to be treated if he were in a similar situation. By the way, uh, most of our laws today are designed to keep us from hurting people. They are usually not designed to force us to do good to people. And I hope that makes sense. This is the difference between most laws and the law of Christ. If I see somebody beat up by the side of the road, the city of Madison really only cares that I don't kick the man while he's there. As I understand it, I have no legal obligation to step in and render aid. There are some good Samaritan laws, but I don't think that's what that's really addressing. As I understand it, good Samaritan laws protect 
from legal damage someone who does choose to stop and help. But generally speaking, uh, we are not obligated to stop and help under the laws of this land. We might have a moral obligation, but usually, as I understand it, we do not have a legal obligation. So that is the difference we might say between civil law and the law of Christ. Generally speaking, civil law keeps us from hurting people, but it does not force us to help. And I know there might be exceptions to this, uh, but I do believe that's true in a general sense. I, I can't go next door and steal food from my neighbor, but I don't have to go shopping for them, at least under the laws of the land. I just can't go stealing. I don't have to do good. Um, Although as a society, as we drift farther and farther away from God, government finds itself stepping in where Christians have been, you know, used to do uh, some of these things in the past. But now there are fewer and fewer people who follow the golden rule. Uh, in verse 35, not only does the Samaritan take care of the man, getting him out of danger, applying first aid on the scene and in the end, but now he also, notice, goes above and beyond. He could have left it here. And he would have been a hero for most people. He needs to be on his way. But number one, he pays the innkeeper to take care of the man in his absence. And then secondly, he tells the innkeeper to do whatever needs to be done and then promises to pay him back when he returns. This is unheard of. This is shocking behavior in a sense. Nobody does this. This is above and beyond. And what makes all of this even more surprising is that this man is a Samaritan. Obviously, Jesus could have left race out of this completely, right? Jesus could have just described this man as a man, and it would have been a great story, would have made the point, but he doesn't leave it there, does he? And it seems that he does this to make a point. Even Samaritans, the kind of people that you love to hate, even they know what it means to love your neighbor. And so we have a lawyer, a religious expert, asking what it means to love your neighbor. And we have a Samaritan who not only gets it, but he is doing it. Let's not forget that Luke loves highlighting minorities. He likes highlighting Gentiles and Samaritans and the sick and women and, and on and on. And this is certainly a story that fits in that pattern. This is an interruption to the man's journey. It is also not only expensive time-wise, it is expensive financially. Notice that the man leaves two denarii with the innkeeper. A denarius was a day's wage. And so he leaves two days' wages behind with the innkeeper and promises more, whatever it takes. Today, two days' wages? What is that for you? We could, you know, go minimum wage. We could go for an average professional type salary in the Madison area. I'm thinking for most people here in Madison, two days wages, two to three hundred dollars or more. And that's what this man leaves with the innkeeper. And this translates maybe into a night or two at a hotel in Madison and some supplies that might be needed, first aid type stuff. So in light of what he has described here, Jesus turns it back on the lawyer and he, he asks another question. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And at this point, the lawyer now throws a new word into this discussion by saying that the neighbor is the one who has shown mercy toward the man. Personally, I find it interesting that the lawyer can't seem to actually say the word Samaritan. The correct answer to Jesus' question here is the Samaritan. But the lawyer cannot say the Samaritan. It, it just probably violates his conscience to praise the Samaritan in this scenario. And so he doesn't say the Samaritan is the neighbor. He says the one who showed mercy to the man, which is just an interesting side note to me. Uh, and it seems we can safely assume here that the priest and the Levite, therefore, did not show mercy mercy. They did not show grace. They are unmerciful. So the Samaritan then is the only one who shows mercy here. And Jesus then says to the lawyer, go and do the same. This then is how we apply the parable of the Good Samaritan, isn't it? Be the Samaritan. Go out there and do what this man did. When we see somebody in need, civil government tells us that we just can't hurt the person. That's not good enough. 
as God's people, we have an obligation to help in some way. And this takes time. This often takes money. It is not convenient. It often means thinking creatively. This man had to change his plans. There was a meeting he was late for, perhaps. This put him off schedule by a couple days. Uh, this man even had to contract out his helping a little bit, which is interesting. He didn't do the helping directly, but he paid someone who could do it on his behalf. But the point is, the man did what needed to be done. And this right here, by the way, will keep us busy for a lifetime, won't it? If we could just focus on being the good Samaritan, we wouldn't have the time or the energy to argue with people about all kinds of stupid stuff that we see people arguing about today, would we? Just get to work and be the Samaritan seems to be the point that Jesus is making here. Our mission is to treat others just as we ourselves would like to be treated. It's not that we're just nice to people who are nice to us. Um, I had a post on Facebook a week or so ago. There's a meme going around. You know, if you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. It's kind of ridiculous. That's morally offensive. Jesus specifically spoke about that and said even tax collectors do that. You know, even the heathens do that. As God's people, we're called to a higher standard. Not just being nice to people who are nice to us. Not just not hurting people as the civil government wants to make sure that we don't do. But we are to treat others as we would like to be treated. We try to put ourselves in their place and ask, if I were in that situation, laying half dead by the side of the road, what would I want somebody to do for me? And once we answer that question, we have an answer to what we need to be doing. And so we get busy with it. And that's a good question to ask. You know, look through the church directory. What would this person appreciate right now? What is needed in this person's life? How can I do that? So that seems to be the application of the parable of the Good Samaritan. All right, let's keep moving then, and we're going to move on to Luke 10, verses 38 through 42. Luke 10, 38 through 42. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care? that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. Based on what we know from John chapters 11 and 12, Mary and Martha live with their brother Lazarus in Bethany, which is a village on the outskirts of Jerusalem, a couple miles away. So here, as he's traveling, Jesus is apparently very close to Jerusalem now, and he comes to stay with this family. And as he's in their home, Mary is sitting at the Lord's feet listening. Martha, on the other hand, is busy. Martha is distracted with the preparations, and Martha seems to be upset. She's mad that Jesus is allowing her sister to listen instead of help, and she wants Jesus to tell Mary to help her. Command her to help me. And I found it interesting. I looked up the Greek word that's used here for help, and it's the idea of taking hold of at the side. So she's saying to Jesus, tell Mary to take hold of the other side. And I get the picture of carrying a heavy load. Uh, a couple days ago, I helped my wife empty her classroom so she could go through her stuff to kind of redo everything for whatever comes next with the school district. And we had to get a couple like little couches out of there that we got at Swap for her students to sit on, kind of a, a spot away from the other kids where they can regroup and refocus and that kind of thing. And so we had to get those couches out of there. We were going to donate them to uh, one of her students' families, and there were a few times getting these couches from the second floor of the school down the stairs, out the front, double doors, and into our car, where I wished I could have said, hey, I need somebody to come get the other side of this. Come take hold of the other side so we can carry this together. And that seems to be what Martha is saying to Jesus. Tell her to go grab the other side of this load that I'm carrying, in some figurative sense. Not that they were carrying couches. 
but help me out here. I'm struggling with all the stuff that I have to do. So it's an interesting family situation. Martha, instead of talking to Mary directly, <laughs> wants Jesus to do it. And she seems to think that Jesus has the authority to tell Mary to do this, which is interesting. And, and what Martha is asking here seems to be fair, seems to be reasonable. But in response, though, Jesus gives a rather surprising answer. He praises Mary for sitting there listening and seems to condemn Martha for being so worried about everything. It seems that Mary has her priorities straight. And of course, looking back on this a few months later, it would probably be a lot more obvious. If we had just a few hours to spend with Jesus himself, would we spend it vacuuming and doing dishes and sweeping the floor and that kind of thing? Or would we spend it listening? I hope we understand most of us, if we had that to do over looking back on it, we would want to spend time listening to the Lord absorbing everything that he had to say. And that seems to be what the Lord is praising Mary for doing here. Notice at the end how Jesus says that Mary is doing what shall not be taken away from her. In other words, Martha's preparations are temporary. This meal is going to come and go. But Jesus is there teaching and listening to the Lord. That is what will be permanent. That's something that Mary will have with her for the rest of her earthly life and even beyond. Okay, let's keep going then, moving over into Luke chapter 11. Let's cover a few paragraphs into Luke 11. Luke 11, 1 through 4 is our next passage tonight. Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. So the passage starts with praying. So we learn Jesus prayed not just for special occasions, like when he picked his 12 apostles. Remember, he stayed up praying all night long the night before that. Not just when he fed the 5,000, very public scenario there. But prayer seems to be something that Jesus did regularly. And after he's praying on this occasion, the disciples want Jesus to teach them to pray. Teach us how to do what you're doing. I find it interesting that it didn't say teach us how to heal, teach us how to sing, teach us how to do this or that. But it was prayer that they really needed help with here. And so they want a lesson. They want to be trained in this, just like John trained his disciples to do things. And so Jesus teaches them to pray. He gives them what we might refer to as a sample prayer. And this is very similar to what's commonly referred to as the Lord's Prayer over in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. There are a few small differences. The timing is different. So this is not the same, but Jesus recycled some lessons. Some things needed teaching more than once, obviously. In this sample prayer, Jesus addresses it to his Father, and so he addresses his father in prayer. Hallowed refers to the father's name being holy. So this is a statement of praise. It's a statement of respect. And as a general rule, that's a good pattern for us to follow today. If we're ever in doubt as to what to pray, address Jesus' father and then include some kind of praise in some way. We're on safe ground there. In both situations, that's the way Jesus started these two sample prayers here and also in Matthew chapter 6. God's kingdom refers to God's rule. So God is the king over his kingdom. His kingdom is made up of those who obey and who have sworn allegiance to the king, we might say. And of course, at the time this was first said, the church had not yet been established. As we've discussed before, almost every reference to the kingdom before Acts 2 points to the future. Almost every reference to the kingdom after Acts 2 refers to the kingdom as already being in existence. And so they're all, you know, everything is pointing to Acts chapter 2 in terms of the establishment of God's rule or God's kingdom here on this earth. So either the church and the kingdom are the same, they are one and the same, or they are very similar with a lot overlapping. Either way, the church is basically the kingdom. So today I wouldn't pray personally for God's kingdom to come because it's already here, isn't it? We are a part of God's kingdom. But as a sample prayer, I would look at this as something of a category. 
We pray for God's kingdom. We pray for the church. We pray for the church to do well. We pray for the church to grow and to be strengthened and so on. So it's always good to pray for the kingdom. As in Matthew, we are to pray for our daily bread. And to me, it seems it's become a little bit more important to pray for our daily bread these days. We've had some food shortages. We seem to be over most of that at this point. But some have struggled, especially over the past few months. 2,000 years ago, though, people would often eat on a day-by-day basis. They would not know where tomorrow's food is coming from. Uh, most of us in our society, though, today could probably survive for a few weeks, if not months, on the food that we have in our homes right now, our house. Our freezer's pretty full right now. The fridge is about half full. I mean, if we had to, we could stretch that out for a few weeks. There's some stuff in the cabinets, and we would be okay for a few weeks. Uh, but as a category, we need to be praying for this. We need to be praying for our daily bread. Everything that we eat comes from God. We might think it comes from a store, <laughs> and it does, but ultimately it comes from God himself. Years ago, one of our members asked me, why do we always pray or only pray right before we eat? And it was a good, honest question, and hopefully we're not only praying before we eat. If you're only praying before you eat, I would suggest uh, bump it up a notch or two. <laughs> and pray. You try praying when you wake up in the morning or as you're driving or walking or before you go to bed at night. But at least praying before we eat is something we do regularly, isn't it? Because food is a daily requirement. And since we're eating, we might as well be thankful to God who has provided the food that we eat. So praying before meals is both good and practical. When we eat, hopefully we don't just dig in immediately as our dogs might. We are beyond that, but hopefully we take time to thank God for what we're about to eat. We do have a number of examples in the Bible of people thanking God for their food before they eat. In verse 4, forgive us our sins. This is how we know this is a sample prayer and not an actual prayer that Jesus ever prayed. Jesus had no sins that need to be forgiven. But as a pattern, as something that we need to be praying for on a regular basis, we need to be praying for forgiveness. Notice, though, that our own forgiveness seems to be tied to us forgiving others. In other words, we can't be begging God for forgiveness when we don't forgive people who do stuff against us. So as we pray for forgiveness, we take that as a reminder to forgive others. And by the way, just because we forgive somebody doesn't necessarily mean that God does. I hope you understand what I'm saying there. I might not hold something against somebody. I might say, it's okay. I might forgive them in a sense, but if they don't work that out with God themselves, they may still need to answer to him for whatever they've done at some point in the future. At the end, lead us not into temptation. God obviously does not lead us into temptation. So as I see it, this is basically asking for God's help in avoiding temptation. We know that whenever we're tempted, God always provides a way out. He always provides a way of escape, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So this is pretty much a reminder to be praying that we might be able to find and to take the way out. In the next paragraph, Jesus continues with a parable about prayer. So let's go on to Luke 11, verses 5 through 8. Luke 11, 5 through 8. Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside, he answers and says, do not bother me. The door has already been shut, and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So we have a scenario here where we have company at the last minute. So we go to a friend at midnight asking to borrow three loaves of bread. In the scenario, then, we are the ones who are desperate. But when we go to a neighbor, he tells us to go away. One thing I find interesting is, from his bed, the neighbor has a conversation with a neighbor who's at his door. What does that tell us? Uh, as I look at this, <laughs> the house is incredibly small, isn't it? We're talking like a one-room little, in our country, I would think, log cabin uh, from the frontier days. A, a one-room little house. 
I know today if somebody were to come to my house at midnight to my front door and, and were to knock, I would not be having a conversation with them from my bed. I would not hear them knocking, first of all. But even if I did, I couldn't have that conversation. It's too far away. So here in the ancient world, we have the picture of a very small house. And this man is in bed. He's got his children piled all over him. He's like, I can't get up. I, my kids are in bed. We're, we're down for the night. The door's locked. I can't do that. In the end, though, Jesus says the guy will eventually get out of bed, not because they're friends, but because of the man's persistence, because he keeps on knocking. So the application of this comes in the next paragraph. So let's keep moving to Luke 11, 9 through 13. And this is our last paragraph tonight. Luke 11, 9 through 13. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he is asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So in response to the story about the persistent friend at midnight, Jesus applies this to prayer. Just as one friend will relent and give in to a persistent neighbor, so also God will respond when we ask, seek, and knock. And then he compares God to an earthly father. Just as we love doing good things for our children, we are not devious. We are not evil when our children ask us for something. So also the Lord God loves giving good gifts to us. He is not devious. He is not evil but he loves giving us what we ask for. And the specific reference here is to the Holy Spirit. He doesn't tell us what he means by this here, so I think we'll just leave it right there. In the big picture, pray because God loves answering our prayers. I know we had originally last week hoped to get a little bit further than this, but this seems to be a good stopping point. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight, uh, either online or on the phone. Be sure to send me any prayer requests or concerns so I can get those in the bulletin, get those updated. Uh, next week, let's come prepared by reading the rest of Luke 11. You might also want to look at this in Harmony of the Gospels. Again, if you don't have this book yet, uh, there is still time to get it before class next week. Let me know if you need any help finding that. But let's close this evening with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come to you in prayer tonight, praising you for being the one and the only Almighty God. You have promised to listen and respond when we ask, seek, and knock. And so we come to you tonight asking for your forgiveness. When we sin against you, when we sin against those around us, we ask for your mercy, we ask for your grace. We continue to persistently ask that you bless us with resources individually and as a congregation so that we might be able to share with those in need. We pray for those who work in the medical field that they might be safe and that we might come to the end of this crisis quickly if it is your will. Tonight we're thankful for what we have learned from the book of Luke. As we continue living in this world, we pray that we might be like the Good Samaritan, that we might see, that we might have compassion, and that we might actually do whatever it is that needs to be done. We pray that we might always treat people just as we ourselves would like to be treated, even if it's inconvenient, even if it's difficult. Tonight, we're thankful that Stacy's COVID test has come back negative. We're thankful that Jerry is home from the hospital with his pacemaker, that he's doing much better. We praise God for these two bits of good news. We ask, though, that you continue to be with those who continue to struggle. Allow us, as your people, to lift up and to encourage. We come to you with these requests in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.